Hey, Jesse, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you on. Finally, we did it. I'm so happy to be here, Karen. It's great to see you and be in your world. Thank you so much. And Jesse and I met, we were talking beforehand about eight months ago, maybe last October. Yes. October 2017 at the Unfair Advantage, which is run by Chris Winfield out of New York City. And then we saw each other again in February, right? Yes. Where That's I was, right. I didn't really have a voice and I was still a little sick and it was freezing. <laughs> And, um, but two, at two really great events, and I'm so happy that at the second one, we had a little more time to kind of interact and, and get to know each other a little bit more. So in that vein, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about yourself, kind of fill in some of the blanks for the listeners. Great. I, my mastery is in money and spirituality and the intersection of those two things. I teach sales as a spiritual practice, and my mission is really to help spiritual people, spiritual practitioners, transformational people, healers, health and wellness professionals to integrate the money piece. And that can be difficult. And I'm sure you, like, what kind of resistance do you find with some of the clients that you work with? Because I'm sure there's a lot. Sure. I mean, there, there's... In the way that I see it in both my clients, and also I think this is quite global, I would say. The first piece is just allowing ourselves to know what we want and want what we want in the first place. So most people don't actually do that. They don't, they don't, it's like we have these ceilings that we put on ourselves unconsciously through our cultural programming, our family programming, just, just what we're exposed to. And based on those things, we, we vision and have desires within that, right? Because it's safe. It's like, if in, inside this little box, I know I can get what I ask for, so I'll just ask for that. When in fact, the whole universe of possibility is actually available to us, whatever we want, we can create, that's what we're here for. But it's, it's like it takes a whole rewiring and this is why mindset work is so powerful, so pervasive, like it's such important, impactful work. There's no question. And that's why I'm glad today we're going to be talking about the four main problems, and maybe there's probably more, that get in the way of manifesting the wealth that you want. I know I personally have a lot of blocks around this area, uh, and I feel like I probably are, always have. So let's dive right in and talk about these main problems. So I'll hand it over to you, problem number one. So let's, let's actually like incorporate what I just said as problem number one, mm -hmm. because I, I think that that's worth emphasizing, right? That people don't actually allow themselves to want what they want, to know what they want. Because there's some taboo either explicitly or just unconsciously about saying that. So just as an example, in my own life, it truly never occurred to me to want to be wealthy. In part because for me, when I was growing up, my perception was that the wealthy people in my community and the children of those wealthy people were kind of mean. Interesting. And so I just like early, early on came up with this idea that like, that's not me. Mm -hmm. And so I just didn't even consider it, right? At every point in my life when I had the option to choose between creating more wealth or less wealth, I chose less <laughs> because I had some idea totally unconscious that that was like a more honorable or a more Jesse path. Mm -hmm. And so it took living that life for, you know, until I was 35 of like really struggling to prioritize money in a, in a significant way, in an abundant way, in a more than enough way to, to have the contrast experience of realizing like, oh, I don't actually enjoy this. I'm feeling very limited in my life. I actually do want more. And then when I started to explore what that meant, realizing like, oh, I want to be, I want to live with wealth in my life. That was radical. And I think that that process is, is very, very emotionally activating for most people. It's not a simple, like intellectual thing to just flip that switch. There's a lot of emotional material that comes up when we do that work. Yeah. So that's the first piece, the first kind of obstacle 
the first reason that people don't have the wealth that they want is because they don't know what wealth they want. And they, they, and there's all these blocks that they have built or allowed to be built in their, in their psyches about what they're allowed to want. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I feel like just your telling your story really resonates with my thoughts as well of it's kind of funny how we would put such a negative attachment to people with wealth and I don't know why that is because I have met plenty of people with wealth who could not be more generous and giving and kind and and but it's those you know deep-seated thoughts that we have as kids that just cling to our side with everything we do, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is, you know, just to name it also, this is something that I see in myself, in my clients especially, that, that allowing ourselves to be present with our current reality, to see what it is, to know what it is, to accept what it is, and at the same time, choose to value or prioritize or reach for something different feels very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you just like some, one of your listeners today is totally going to have the experience of like, Oh my God, I totally get what she's saying. And now that I'm hearing that I totally want like a hundred thousand dollars a month. Right. Someone will have that experience. And then as soon as that happens, then immediately they are faced with an experience of contrast right? Where they're, this moment reality does not look like $100,000 a month. So they're projecting a desire into the future. It's actually how we create, but it feels uncomfortable to be wanting something and not having it in this moment. Yes. And so there's a, there's a real vulnerability there, a real tenderness in, in wanting, because you have to, you have to kind of believe that your, your, your whole experience of life of all the times that you were disappointed, all the times you reached for something and didn't get it all the time, right? You have to be willing to reach again. <laughs> even though you've been disappointed in the past, even though it hasn't always worked out, you have to almost kind of clean the slate. It's like, well, so what? So what? It didn't work out in the past. Today, I want whatever it is that you want. And I'm going to choose it. I'm going to reach for it. And, that's and so this, to do. it's very, 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 very vulnerable. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Because you're putting yourself into that position of, well, like you said, if you failed before, you're less likely to want to put yourself out on, on the limb again, you know, or I, I have this idea, I think I can do it. And, but I tried it before it didn't work. And then maybe you get some negative reinforcement from friends, even though they don't mean to be negative, but they're oh, saying, well, why would, why would you do that? Why would you want yeah. to do that? Oh, that's the worst. Then you're like, yeah, <laughs> why would I want to do that? You're right. I shouldn't try it at all. Yeah. I shouldn't go for it. I shouldn't go for what I feel I deserve. It's a tough yes. to be. It's, it's, you're absolutely right. So, you know, that's a, we could call, I hadn't put that on my, my list initially, but this is another piece, you know, like your current environment will never line up with the, the future vision, at least not 100%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, that's just the nature of growth, right? If you think about like a sequoia tree growing into the sky, inevitably it's growing into space it's never occupied before. That's the nature of growth. Trees, because they don't have the kind of consciousness that we do, benefit and, and limitation there, they don't experience fear of growing. They just grow. So there's a part of us in our deep nature that has that same design. We're meant to grow. But then we also have these subconsciouses that are designed to keep us safe and protected. And they make it, we, that's why we feel the fear. And so then, then that the experience of basically difference between our present moment and the future one we want to create or between what we want to create and what our families or friends think we should create or between what we think we're creating and the results that we're getting that don't match up, right? Like those experiences are always uncomfortable. And a huge part of what I teach my clients is just how to live in the space of discomfort with as much comfort as possible. 
<laughs> it's like getting okay. comfortable with what's uncomfortable, getting, yeah. get coming to a yes to all of that. Yeah. And, and that is so powerful. And I feel like if you can get to that point where you're allowing yourself to know what you want and making it clear what you desire, that's got to be a big, huge hurdle to get past to manifesting that wealth you want and to creating that wealth you want. So that's, that's got to be step number one. Absolutely. If, if we're talking of quote unquote steps. Yeah. But if you're talking in steps, it's got to be up there uh, high on the list. Well, and I, I like this. I, this feels like a good transition to another one of the things that I think is such a block for mm -hmm. people. Um, and it's funny because I, 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 some of you guys may know, but I'll just, this is my outing myself. I used to be a public school math teacher. I know it. That was like my entry into, into this career. I started in New York City public schools and I taught math for a long time. In my childhood, I was really good at math. That was like, it was a thing I was really excited about. And, and so that may be part of why I emphasize this. But the truth is that the math, the math that I teach now is the simple, it's like fourth grade arithmetic. It's not complicated math. Uh, anyone can do it. But there's a, a resistance that most people experience to actually working the numbers. And, and it's connected to the knowing what you want. So it's like once you know what you want, then you have the, the number, that concrete information to actually do the math and see how you're going to get there. Because the truth is that most people are not, they're either not charging enough or they're not selling enough. That's like, why don't we have the wealth we want? Those are in, on a material plane that it's one of those two things. Makes sense to me. And we only have so many hours in the day. And I think especially for your listeners, this is a big, big, big important thing because the solution most of the time in my my like my experience of wellness practitioners the solution is not working twice as much in my experience wellness practitioners work more than any any other field they they need to work less <laughs> and so that means that hence yeah. the burnout <laughs> exactly so you know in that situation it's like you know you choose the number that you want to make in a week and work backwards or a month or a year or whatever Mm -hmm. But I think a week is a good frame for people that are doing like, you know, contact hours with other human beings to think about how many people you, need, you want to see in a week, not how many people you need in order to make the money, but how many you actually want to see. How many would you love to like, what would be really relaxing, abundant, easy, playful, fun? How would you feel like you could have the most impact, all that stuff? then do the math to connect that number of people to the amount of money that you want to make. And then you have your price mm -hmm. and then great. That's it. There's no, like if, if all of my clients could just do the math and there was no emotional material around it, they'd all be done. We'd have like one session and they would never work with me again. <laughs> you know, be like this Jesse's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Cause it really is that simple. It, I know it's that simple and I do that. <laughs> I have, but, done <laughs> I know that's what I do. Oh, I have like I have a set number of people that are visits that I would like to see a week. So for me, it's between 22 and 25 one on one sessions a week for me is perfect. I make mm -hmm. my weekly goals. I make my monthly goals. But I most often am seeing between 30 and 35 a week because healthcare workers work hard. But right. It, and it's because like, if I'm not going to turn someone away, so I just do it. What, why do you have to sacrifice in order to support okay. the people that come to you? Um, I think because if I don't do that, like I'm going to, I'm going to feel bad for not helping. So, Does that make sense? I think it's like, I'll feel like, even if I am, and I've done this, like I have been filled to the brim five days a week. I'm like, you know, I'll see you on Saturday. You know, no big deal. I'll, I'll see you on a Sunday. That's, it, that's fine. I can do that. And part of me is, well, I feel bad if I can't, but, but 
the other part of me, let's say in the realm of this is, well, I have all this abundance right now. I don't want to turn it down because what happens in a month or two if it's not there? Does that make sense? If what's not there? If this abundance of patience or cash oh, oh, oh. is not there in a couple of months. So if all Have you experienced my, that? Well, sometimes like when it comes to the summer, like you sort of roller coaster a little bit. I live in, in Manhattan. A lot of my patients go away for the summer. So yeah, I may like work my tail off in March, April, and May working a lot, but then June, July, and August, things start to slow down a little bit and then I can concentrate on other things. But I know this and work it into my, into my plan for the year. But yeah, even if I didn't have a slowdown, I probably still would, would feel like, well, one day this isn't gonna be here, so I need to take advantage of what I'm doing now. Do you hear that a lot? Yeah. I didn't think this was going to turn into a therapy session, Jesse. <laughs> and you're going to make me cry. <laughs> well, so, and I mean, we don't have to, obviously, this is your podcast. We don't have to go all the way no, in there. But this, no. what you're doing is highlighting this, this more emotional piece. And it's real. So it's not something, just again, for your listeners. Yeah. If it were, if it were truly as easy for us as human beings to just work the math, we wouldn't need coaches for the most part. Right. We wouldn't need therapists. We wouldn't need wellness practitioners. We wouldn't need healers. But we do because we're all of us walking around with all this, I would say, trauma mm -hmm. from the programs that we took in when we were little by, for the most part, not any malicious intent, right? Like, like we just all are. Osmosis of the people around us. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so it's like, this is the opportunity of the lifetime. This is the opportunity. This is why we came into these bodies. This is my, my spiritual perspective on this. That we came into these bodies to learn exactly these lessons, to experience the karma of our ancestors and, and clear it. Right? So the, the, and that requires support, mm -hmm. which is why you and your audience are so important. And it's why it's so important that you guys, all of you, your whole field be making money and thriving because if you're not thriving, eventually you will burn out and then you can't help people. So this is my, this is my little image for you guys. Uh huh. This is not, I drew one like this before we got on the call, but this is a new one. Just okay. for you. <laughs> uh, and my handwriting is a little sloppy, but can you see this is like more yeah. than enough for me, not enough for me, more than enough for them, not enough for them. Uh huh. So Basically, your experience, as an example, and this is so common, yeah. is that you either, you choose between one of these blue circles. Mm -hmm. One person has to sacrifice, mm -hmm. right? So either you yeah. give up your Saturday or they don't get help. Right. That's how you see it in your mind. Correct. Yes. And the truth is that can't, that actually cannot be the only two options. There has to be there these other be two. More. Yes. At a minimum. And this is all very generalized, but you know, the truth is, this is actually really fun. We could think about it as like, when you sacrifice your Saturday, you are going to show Let's like take that to the extreme, right? Six years of sacrificing Saturdays. And how are you going to be showing up on Saturday? Probably a little low energy, maybe not wanting to be there a hundred percent, not enough for me, not enough for them. Yeah. So, so now you're, you're sacrificing yourself for so long that as a result, your sacrifice and your annoyance, if you will, of having to work every single Saturday shows up, manifests itself in the treatment you're giving your clients because you're not showing up a hundred percent for them. That's right. And so the, the, I love the way that you just said that, because <clears throat> even though it could really, truly, most people have this kind of duality, this binary set up in their mind unconsciously, that they think that somebody has to lose and they don't want it to be the other person because they're here to be of service. And so they choose to, to sacrifice themselves. Mm -hmm. But, but if any, I bet anyone that's listening would say the same thing that you just said, they know that if they choose this over and over and over again, ultimately it lands up here, which is not in service to this person. No. So even if this could work, right? Like even if you could sacrifice yourself 
and it would be of service to this other, sorry, I'm pointing at the wrong one. Even if you could sacrifice yourself and it would be of service to your client in the short term, mm -hmm. in the long term, it's not going to be. And so the only, really the only box that's a legitimate choice here is this one. Mm -hmm. So how do we get into that box? So going back to the beginning of our conversation, the first thing is to see that this box is what you want in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it means that when you are faced with the choice where you're like, okay, I could go in on Saturday and see this person, but I've made a decision that I don't want to work on Saturdays. I need those days to recoup. Then you, you know, immediately that that, that isn't the solution. So there must be another one. Right. What could that other one be? Right. And immediately, as soon as you shift, then more possibilities will show themselves to you. But those possibilities aren't necessary. If you think that Saturday is a possibility, you won't get creative. You won't get resourceful mm -hmm. if you're willing to sacrifice yourself. So it's like that first step is that you, you are committed to this box. You're committed to finding the solutions that are more than enough for you and more than enough for them. Always relentlessly, unapologetically, without compromise. This is what it means to cultivate abundance. And then what happens if you go through your head, well, if I can't do Saturdays, then they're going to go to someone else and then I'm going to lose that person or I'm going to lose that revenue, which I'm, I know, I saw a little smirk on your face. I know people say that to you. <laughs> well, there's what's what's the you've spoken this already, but I want to bring it in because mm -hmm. we're doing this for other people so that they're yeah. really clear about the logic. What's the underlying fear of, of of what you just said? So like, let's say one solution for this is mm -hmm. they go to someone else. Yes. Right. Then you don't give up your Saturday and they have support. Mm -hmm. What is, is a good thing? It's a good, I mean, let's just slow down here. Does that actually fit this box? It does. So, but there's a part of you in your brain that's like, but wait, if I do that, ooh, this is good. If I do this long enough, then eventually, once again, there won't be enough for me. Mm -hmm. that's, what your, that's what your subconscious thinks. Mm -hmm. If I don't snatch every potential client that comes to me, then eventually they'll run out. Right. And, and I mean, it's a question, is that true? I mean, in reality, probably not, because I think there's always going to be someone that you find that aligns with what you do and how you do it. And so, yes, you will always have, you know, a line of people. And, and I remember I used to think to myself sometimes like, oh boy, boy, I have a couple of people finishing up with their uh, plan of cares. I'm like, Oh, geez, how, what, what if like no one else comes back? What if I don't get it? And, but then it would always happen. Like the next week I would get calls for like three more people wanting to start or even more. And I'd always just chalk it up to, well, I just put it out into the universe and it answered me and there you go. But there's gotta be something deeper there. There's gotta be more than just chalking it up to that. I mean, it or I think it? you're right there. I think you're, yeah. no, I think you're absolutely right. And I'm sure that there are people, again, listening to you who actually have experienced times when they're like, I really freaking need some clients and I don't know where they are. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an understandable experience that creates this paradigm. Mm -hmm. That's that. And just to name it also, that's why once again, working the numbers isn't typically enough. It's, it's essential. It's a prerequisite, but it's not sufficient to get people mm -hmm. where they need to go because it takes real balls <laughs> to prioritize this yeah, relentlessly, right? Even yeah. in the face of those fears, like, well, you know what? Like, here's how I'm thinking about it, just in this specific example. I'm gonna refer this person to a colleague of mine because I don't have time mm -hmm. and this person needs support right away. And I want them to have their support and I want me to have my Saturday. I'm not, I, it's not going to serve them. I, I've done this thinking mm -hmm. logically. I know it's not going to serve them if I sacrifice my Saturday. So I'm not going to do that. And therefore that means that somebody else needs to be the one to help them. Down the road, that person that I referred to is going to run into the same situation. Yes. And then they're going to refer back to me. A hundred percent. And that happens all the time. All the time. 
all the time. Yeah. So, so, and this is just to put it out there, like a little seed of, of the, the, this kind of bigger vision or mission that I have that the, the idea that if all of us, like today, all people who are here to be of service, all of us decided today, this is the end. We're not self-sacrificing anymore. Then bam, all of a sudden, not only are we individually experiencing this, the whole planet is getting this because the people that are service providers are modeling, they're transmitting a holistic health model. They're not just teaching at the expense of themselves. They're not just healing at the expense of themselves, which is martyrdom, ultimately burnout, mm -hmm. ultimately that's mm -hmm. not service. It's like a full integrated thing. There's, there's only abundance there. So it's, it's a whole cultural revolution, what we're talking about. Yes. Also, I mean, just there's other solutions. Like we've been talking about one yeah. solution where you refer out, but there's others, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like you, you said, you have to be steadfast in order to think of what those solutions can be. You have to hold yourself in that space and not, I call it like, oh, I always cave in. Yeah. Or yeah, I always, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I always cave and I'm always like trying to please others. I want everyone to be happy and but there are probably other solutions that could make those people happier. But if you don't think about it, if you don't give yourself the space to think about it, you'll never come up with them, right? Yeah, and it's, it, I loved hearing you say that. It's such, a, such an honest, like, pr like putting a microphone on those internal thoughts. I think we all have that. And the unspoken piece of what you, it's like, I want these people to be happy. I want these people to be helped. And what you didn't say, but I think most of us have this second sentence almost is like, I want them to be helped and I'll do anything to make sure they're helped, mm -hmm. including sacrifice myself. Mm -hmm. And so it's that second sentence that has to change, not the first one, right? You still, it's not like, that's the whole, the whole benefit of this little mental model is that you don't have to choose between these two. You really are like, I'm choosing both. I'm choosing to be of service no matter what, and I'm choosing to serve myself no matter what. If it seems to me that I have to choose, I'm not buying into it. I just don't believe it anymore. I'm deciding right now, I'm not gonna believe that. There has to be another option where no one has to lose. And actually, just to shout out Chris Winfield, I feel like this is something that I have because he talks about it so much, been really looking at more closely, which is the win-win. Mm -hmm. This is the win-win, what we're talking about here. It Abundance is, right. is the win-win. So if you've, you know, like just going back to pricing or something like that, because mm -hmm. I can imagine that a lot of your listeners have some anxiety about raising their prices mm -hmm. to what they would really need to charge in order to make the kind of money that they want. Mm -hmm. And to, to just feel into what it would be like for those prices to be actually better for clients. Just imagine, feel what comes up when that comes up. So in any case, like just as an example, to, all, yeah. to look for the win-win. And so if somebody else has to sacrifice, then that's not quite it. If you have to sacrifice, that's not quite it. There's, yeah. another, there's another solution. There's another solution. And I think oftentimes we fall back on the comfort solutions, the things that we have seen work in the past, so it'll probably work in the future, which is probably a logical fallacy because just because it worked in the past doesn't mean that it's going to work in the future. And perhaps there are things that are better solutions than what you've done in the past. Absolutely. Always. We're always evolving. Yeah. Always growing. Whew, that was a deep dive. I love it. Now, let's talk about, so let's say we, we have this thought of changing our mindset. So now the seed is planted. Okay. We want to have a win-win, a win for us, a win for our clients, because that's when we know we're showing up at our best. We are, we are doing what we do best in the right context at the right time. And everybody wins from that. So we've got this sort of desire. We know we can, we know we can do it. What are some mm -hmm. other things that might get in the way after that? or at the same time? Uh, it's a, I feel like this whole conversation, you and I are exactly the same wavelength. Like the very thing that I'm like, oh, I wanna talk about this thing next. And when you ask the perfect question, win, win, win. So <laughs> um, 
yeah, it, what came up for me listening to you say that is that the work, so let's zoom out. The work of wellness professionals, whether they're PTs or coaches or mm -hmm. Reiki healers or yoga teachers, yoga. whatever, is, is to, first of all, be of service and help people. And in particular, to help people heal, right? To help people feel better physically, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, the integration of all of their different bodies, you know? And we, we have to, like our growth edge as those service providers is to be continuing to master that material in ourselves. So what better way than by exploring exactly the question that you just asked. So when we are, it's like we've decided, okay, I, wanna, I want to prioritize the win-win in my life. And for me, that means making as much money as I want and need and helping my clients more than ever before. They get faster results, they get bigger results, whatever. That, that's a, a process of evolution and growth. Like it makes me think about the, um, just the way that like mankind learned to use tools at some point, right? There was the point before we learned how to do that. And then we were like, oh, we can use like rocks and sticks and stuff to do things to like hunt and gather and whatever it is we're trying to do, build. And then suddenly it's not better or worse than what was before, but we just have more tools and resources available to us. So in my experience, the most powerful professional development tools are exactly what we're talking about. It's this mindset work. It's this inner work. Like, where am I limiting my belief in what's possible? Where do I think the win-win still has to come? Like, it's either got to be kind of a small win-win or it's got to have like a little, there's still a little sacrifice built in there, right? And then what can I do to really take that out? And it's a constant process that never ends. That This is one of the other misconceptions that I think comes is that we get to the finish line and then we're done. You mean you, your mindset has changed and then poof, you never have to work on it again. Right, exactly. That's not, that's not how the human, that's no. not how human nature works. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> right, and so this is actually a fun place too that I think a lot of wellness professionals are actually masterful at understanding this, right? They teach this. Mm -hmm but then they internally are telling a different story and then making themselves wrong or not good enough or whatever, because they haven't gotten to this place that they, they feel they should be. So, I mean, I, and I can just share, we were talking about this at the beginning, maybe this is a good time to like give a little show and tell that I just moved into my dream house. I know, it's gorgeous. Just Here. so people are aware, that's the ocean. Yeah, that's the Pacific right out there. Mm -hmm. It just goes <laughs> like, for like, I want to say millions of miles. It's not actually millions of miles, but thousands of miles. It just extends. It's such massive greatness. And then, you know, I can't show you because I just have a little patio on the other side, but going this direction, the opposite side is LA. Mm -hmm. So I have this beautiful abundance of like the most magnificent nature on one side and still being right in the middle of mm -hmm. Venice. And so this, for me, this was a growth edge in my own mindset. I knew that I wanted this home at least a year ago. My lease was up in May. I knew I wanted this, but I didn't really know it was possible. And, it, and the process of manifesting this house really showed me where my own mindset was still capped, mm -hmm. right? I had like a ceiling on what I thought was possible. And so it's been a real very like emotional and tender and a little bit dramatic and challenging and then very expansive and then tender in that way gift to to struggle to manifest this place and when i say that just to to just share because i feel like this is such a beautiful gift that now i have to share with other people that it was just challenging for like two months mm. and then i figured out what i needed to figure out and that took, I mean, in a way that took those two months to do that work. But had I, now in retrospect, it's easy to be like, well, I could have just done that in two minutes if I'd been willing to, okay. So I was willing to look at the uncomfortable thing that I didn't want to look at. 
And then it changed instantaneously, instantaneously. It wasn't like, and then it took another two months to get it out. Or like in those two months, I, I got over a hump that mm -hmm. took about a month and then it took another month to matter. Mm -hmm. No, it took two months of me bullshitting and fucking around. Mm -hmm. And then literally in an instant, this place manifested, signed the lease, done. So the challenge that I went through in my own internal psychic stuff. And, and was it that you didn't think you deserved a place like this or that, cause obviously you did the math and you could afford it. So, well, but, but did you not feel like you deserved it? Did you not feel like it was going to be the best place for you? Like how, cause a lot of people say, well, I manifested it and then it happened and you're like, well, uh, whatever. But what does that even mean? Do you know what I so, mean? I think you get, I think some people you get the old, all right, well, I'd like to manifest, you know, uh, a boyfriend it just doesn't mean they pop up out of thin air so but they do that's the thing so and and i i will answer your question i think yes. it, it's a very important question but i i want to address that piece first because yeah. that's part of the lesson of this for me mm -hmm. that yeah that it really is that straightforward so we are literally all of us learning what we're creating by what we see in our environment, by what we experience. And this, this is really a, this is the topic of personal responsibility, you could say. And it's very, very, very misunderstood. And it's hard for people to understand. It's like, it's not actually a complex idea, but there's so many defenses and, and like resistances that come up around this that it's hard for people. So I'm just flagging that. So everybody that's listening to this can just like relax mm -hmm. and like open up on purpose just like get curious even if you think that what i'm saying doesn't make sense or you don't like it like soften around that just to stay just to like like mm, i don't really like it but maybe let me just try it on okay mm -hmm. we know what we're doing on the inside what we're choosing on the inside consciously and unconsciously by what we see on the outside so if you say oh i want a boyfriend and you do not immediately have one that is because there is some part of you on the inside, and apparently it's a stronger part, that is getting in the way, that either doesn't want the boyfriend or is afraid that you're not worthy or that you're gonna fuck it up if you have the boyfriend or that the boyfriend will be shitty to you or that is afraid of being heartbroken or whatever. There's some even more powerful part of you that doesn't want the boyfriend. Otherwise, you would have it. If 100% of you wanted the boyfriend, with all that means, Right? Because boyfriends do mean potential heartbreak. They do mean potential danger. They do mean more complexity and compromise and collaboration and intimacy and all these things that are uncomfortable for us. That is part of what having a boyfriend includes. So if you're a full yes to that, every single piece of you, then there is nothing to stop the boyfriend from coming in. So in my life, the very same example was happening with this house. On the outside, I was like, I want the house. I'm ready for the house. Here's all the things that are on the list. I've done the visioning. I believe it. I teach this fucking mindset thing. I know it's here. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then every time that I would go to see a house and it didn't look like this, I would immediately doubt that it was possible. It, like now when I look back at it, I was like, it was literally madness, like crazy, crazy. But this is what most of us do. We use our external environment to tell us what's possible. That's not what's possible. It's just what we're currently creating. Anything is possible. So, but I would, you know, so there were a bunch of places on, that we looked at that were not on the ocean because I wasn't, I didn't a hundred percent believe that I could have this place. Eventually, I sorted that out. I was like, okay, I, can't, I'm, I won't live anywhere else. I have to see this. It's the whole point. Mm -hmm. Once we made that decision, then we saw tons of places that were just ugly on the inside. They had these beautiful views, but they, were abs they looked like you know, some vacation rental home or like my grandparents' idea uh -huh. of beauty or something. It was just like, I wouldn't actually want to be in any of the rooms. I would just want to be on the porch. <laughs> And once again, I was like, oh, okay, well, like, maybe this is the only thing that exists on the beach. I just have to, like, settle. I have to compromise. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't do it. 
And so it took that whole process. I learned a ton about what I was doing to limit my own belief, right? So the, the, if I could go back in time, the message that I would give to myself is, Jesse, stop fucking around with the vision. The vision is the vision. It's here. Just fucking chill. Mm -hmm. Is this the one? Nope. Okay, great. Next. Move on. Yeah. Instead of this whole like emotion, oh my God, I don't know. Maybe it's not here. Maybe yeah. I, have to go. Yeah. Right? I spent all this intellectual, emotional, and spiritual energy just making a mess, Karen, like a goddamn mess of my whole energetic field every time I went to see a house. And so then that, that just kind of can reinforce in your brain, you know, it's not meant to be. That's right. It's not meant to be, even though this is what I want, it's not meant to be. So fuck it. I'm, I'm not even going to try. Uh, this is yep. it. Oh, well, I, I tried. Oh, well. I love that you said that because that's exactly what I was doing. Uh huh. And the, the energetic message of that to myself was I can't have what I want. Mm -hmm. Which, and the energetic undertone of that is I'm not good enough to have what I want. Right. So, so on the surface, like in a conscious way, did I think that I wasn't worthy of this house? No, like consciously I felt very worthy. I wouldn't have chosen this in the mm -hmm. first place if I didn't have that. But unconsciously, there was m like a whole well of unworthiness, of, of fear and doubt and disbelief. And what's so beautiful about this story is that the, the very discomfort that came up as a result of that well, that like pocket of unintegrated negative and inaccurate beliefs about myself, my, like, right, if I had just manifested this place right out the gate, that would have been more comfortable for me. That would have been more fun, you could say. But I wouldn't have transformed this. It would have just stayed in the closet. Mm -hmm. Because our, our universe is designed the way that it is, everything that happened was designed to help me see the truth of what I was doing on the inside, which is making it a mess. Sabotaging yourself. Yeah. Yeah with drama, with doubt, with worry, mm -hmm. with the distraction of the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the shift that happened, I took those two months of like layer by layer, kind of peel, opening that up, like almost like opening the crypt and like letting those ghosts and demons come mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. claiming what belongs to me, letting go of what doesn't, and finally coming to a place of like, you know what, I, I am not interested in anything else and it's kind of like this again right i'm mm -hmm. i'm this is it for me this box was like the place i want to live the price i want the aesthetic that i want the view that i want all that stuff i'm just not interested in any other option mm -hmm. simple Period. yeah and then i'm telling you karen literally in seconds two things happened. I called my real estate agent to tell her just how convicted I was and to, and to send me the listings that would match just this thing only. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And without realizing it, she had already emailed me this place. We'd like crossed. Uh -huh. you know? uh -huh. So I'm, I'm sharing that part of the story because I hadn't even, I didn't even have to tell her. I just had to do the work energetically on the mm -hmm. inside and the whole universe, it's like, the whole universe didn't move around. It was all, this was here was already. There. You just had to see it. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. And I wasn't gonna see it, going back to this sacrifice thing, as long as I was like, oh, I can't have what I want, I wasn't gonna take these blinders off. As soon as it was like, you know what? I don't even care if I can have what I want. I just will. <laughs> I'm going to have what I want, yeah. period, yeah. the end. I'm not interested in any other option. Even if it means whatever it means, like this is what I want, period, the end. I'm investing all of my, what is it? Don't put your eggs all in one basket. Yeah. I put all my eggs in this basket <clears throat> and then instantaneous transformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think something that people need to know and realize, and I think they do with this talk is that it's not, this stuff is not quick fix. You know, we sort of talked a little bit before we, we went on the air about 
people wanting a quick fix, but not being willing to do a deep dive into their, and in this case, into their, into themselves. You know, we were sort of talking about it from an education standpoint that in physical therapy, at least people are paying money and, and without a second thought for things like manipulation courses, dry needling, stuff that are there to give a quick fix, but are unwilling to see the value or the value perhaps, and, and now that I'm thinking about it, maybe it's not, they don't see the value in the course. Perhaps they just don't see how they can relate to that course, or perhaps that course seems a little too difficult. So I, I don't want to go there because I, I don't want to, I don't want to have to put myself in a situation that's really uncomfortable. So a course that's mm -hmm. teaching critical thinking, that's teaching you uh, how to understand research, that's really forcing you to be a little uncomfortable with stuff that you're doing every day versus, well, I can just crack someone's back and, and move on. But instead you have to dive a little bit deeper and it's hard. What I hear this time is even deeper than when we were talking about it before, which is like, of course, of course this phenomenon is showing up because our whole culture is designed to avoid pain. Mm -hmm. Include or, or discomfort, including yeah. the discomfort of like personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So like, let's look at what you're eating and if you're exercising and how you talk to yourself, mm -hmm. not just the diet pill or the, right? Like whatever the quick of fix course, is medication. Yeah, whatever the quick fix is. Yeah. So the, it's like, that's a, that's a cultural phenomenon that each one of us gets to choose to participate in or say, you know what? The buck stops here. I'm, I'm going to stand for something else because I believe in it. I, I'm willing to, and, and, and just that decision is radical because it's saying, I'm willing to be uncomfortable by making a different choice than the dominant paradigm. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to be a little polarizing and actually demand more of healthcare professionals in general by standing for deeper work. I'm not in, I, other people can focus on the quick fix. That's fine. That's up to them, but that's not what I'm here for. And so once again, like I'm thinking about your friends that have this course. Mm -hmm that that for them this box is like a relentless dedication to yeah. deep understanding yeah and and to believe that that is because this is true that is medicine yes just just the offering is medicine for people and so the more we each of us when we make that choice can stand like stand so firm stand so steadfast with such relentless devotion to our choice to our principle to our value then the people that want that too will be magnetized and it's not going to be everybody and it shouldn't be and it, no 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 and and that's okay and that has to be okay because you feel it, like yeah no go ahead i'm just curious if you feel like that addresses their like did I, that address their concern or is there more i i think it does and and i think that what you said about like, I'm putting my stake in the ground. I'm putting my flag at this point and saying, this is where I am, take it or leave it. But this is where I am. And this is where I want to see our profession go. You know, like I'm a, a big fan of what I feel is if it's good, good for one, it's good for the profession. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, and so I feel like they'll get a lot out of this. And I think that they will also get a little bit of solace that, okay, what we're doing is what we believe in and we're not wavering from it and they don't. Um, but it can get very frustrating sometimes when you see everyone else succeeding by doing these quick fix things and you're trying so hard to make, like you said, a paradigm shift and people aren't, they're not gravitating towards it in the way you want it to. I'm just, yeah, I, 
there's so many assumptions there too that I think are worth looking at. I don't know how much time we want to yeah, spend we'll on just it. Keep, but... you could, we'll, we'll spend a little time on it. Why not? Okay. This is this is good. We're going deep here and I love, I'm okay. loving it. So we can okay. split this into three podcasts if we have to. <laughs> okay. It's fine. Um, it's almost like, so there's a, there's a, a lack based or a scarcity based belief or feeling underneath what you just said in terms of like all these other people are so successful with their quick fix thing. Why am I not? Why am I struggling? Mm -hmm. Um, and of course that's, again, don't, I'm not trying to make that wrong or be critical of that, but just to look at the the truth of what we're doing when we take that stance, Mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of actually what we're doing is putting our stake in the ground next to our victimhood rather than our vision it's like the fact that there's so many people successful with the quick fix thing is all the more reason that i am going to be successful because very few people are doing this thing and it's even more powerful than the quick fix and in fact all those people that are signing up for the quick fix thing are going to realize the limitations of that because they've signed up for the quick the quick fix thing they're going to do it and they're going to realize it doesn't work fully Mm -hmm. Or like it catches some things, but not everything. And, and in fact, I'm going to decide that I see the quick fix model as actually somebody else has built a sales funnel for my program. (laughs) The quick fix is like intro session and all those people are now prime candidates for my thing. Mm. That's, that's like one, just a retelling of the story. it's, It's a great way to retell it. And, you know, I often... I love that you brought that up and it brought something up. I remember when I was a younger therapist going to all these manual therapy courses and learning how to pop and crack and move and all this stuff. And I used to always say like, I used to always think to myself, I mean, this is great, but, but I feel like there's something that's missing. There's something I'm, I'm not integrating. I'm not fully integrating here. Something's missing. And then it wasn't until I really took a, a deeper dive into getting out of a biomedical model where it's like A plus B equals C, right? So you know how you said before, if all we do is look at the math, it's easy. But we have to go way beyond the math. And I feel like this biomedical model is the math. Here Mm -hmm. it is. We can look at this. We can reverse engineer it. And it just, it should work every time because Mm -hmm. that's math. But that math is attached to a human being. Yeah. And so all of a sudden the quick fix doesn't really work anymore because we're not addressing the rest of the human being. We're not thinking critically about our patients. We're not looking at them at from all different lenses, which we call a biopsychosocial view. But in in the talk in in as far as this talk goes, what you said earlier, if it's just the math, what what's the problem? But it's never just the math. Yeah, I agree. If it were just the math, that would be easy and none of us would be doing what we're doing. There's mm-hmm. more. There's mm-hmm. more. Mm-hmm. The, it, it just occurred to me, this is just a specific like suggestion for your friends, but that they might actually try explicitly building partnerships with those quick fix people. Even the ones that they're kind of turned off by. Like to call them and say, hey, I totally appreciate what you're doing. And I wanted to share with you that I offer something that might really complement your work. And so if you ever have participants or clients who, or students or whatever, who want a deeper approach, then please send them my way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people will be like, oh, that's not what we do. We don't actually believe in that. Fine. That's fine. They're not the partners, but there will be people who are like, oh my God, thank God. Cause I don't like to do that work. And I would love to be able to refer people to Uh you. Uh Exactly. (laughs) You know, and now we're back to that little square on the top where it's good for you. It's good for them. It's a win-win. Yeah. And you know, and this also comes from Chris. It's like good for you, good for them, and good for the all the people that you guys are going to collectively serve together. So it's like a three dimensional. It's, it's like a yeah. It's like a matrix win win win. It's like a win inside of a win inside of a win. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe it's not the Matrix. What's that other movie with Leonardo DiCaprio? Oh, Inception. It's like an yeah. Inception. Yeah. 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 I um, love that. <laughs> but but yeah, and I think all of this, everything that we talked about, definitely goes back to how you manifest your wealth and, and 
And in the end, all of a sudden, it doesn't really come down to dollars and cents, does it? I mean, it does, because you have to make a living. And, and you want to you wanna have what you want to have. But it sounds like if you can if you can manifest in yourself a way to see the world differently and to have those wins upon wins upon wins upon wins, that the wealth will, will follow because you're doing the work you're meant to do, if that makes sense. And there's more to it. I think that's overly simplistic, but I'm sure but there's more to that's it. That's wonderful though, because it, it, it's like, there's a pulsation. I think that's really helpful here. It's like to go from simplicity to complexity and back mm -hmm. and forth. It's like, mm -hmm. they're both true. Everything that you just said is true. And the only reason that there is more complexity, I think, is if someone is using what you just said to justify not thinking about the financial component, mm -hmm. which sometimes happens, right? So it's like, if you're, if you're doing everything that you just said, living your purpose, focusing on the win-win and you're thinking about money. You're not like putting a blinder up around mm -hmm. it. I think that you're right. I think it's that simple. Mm -hmm. And then, we, and then just using the contrast to go deeper, right? That's the, like, that's the self mastery piece. That's why I teach money and sales as spiritual practice, because when we use our businesses and our sales and our relationships to our clients and all of that stuff for our own personal development, then the spiritual mastery that previously we were just trying to meditate to is now available much more quickly, holistically and in, in integration, like in form. Then I think entrepreneurship is one of the most powerful spiritual practices there is. So it's like, I'm here. I am holding the vision. I'm living my purpose. I'm calling in abundance and ease, which by the way, that was my other little pun and square for you. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, wealth, ease, lack, sacrifice. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Right. So like most people are walking around thinking that they can choose wealth, but it means a sacrifice like of time, of energy, of or, or integrity. Like you said mm -hmm. before, they're mean. Right. I mean, you know, maybe they're not, if they're wealthy, then they're sacrificing their person. Yeah. Or that they can like, that if they want ease in their life, if they want that abundance in their life in terms of who, who they are, this may, this is, this is just one example Yeah, that that somehow means that they have to live in scarcity. Mm -hmm. So, but as it turns out, all these things are true. Of course, all of them are options. All of them are choices that we can make. There's tons of people who sacrifice their integrity and live in poverty, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, I mean, j just to be totally honest, anyone that's a people pleaser, which is a lot of health and wellness professionals, mm -hmm. anyone that is willing to sacrifice their Saturday, right? They are often also living in lack. They're also living in scarcity. So it's not like there's this recipe for success. If you're willing to sacrifice yourself, then you can have wealth. And if you are committed to eat, like it's, it's just really clear when you go deeper that all these are options. And so once again, if you're choosing this, committed to this, prioritizing this, this is also the question you asked a little while ago. It's like, and then you don't experience it one day. Mm -hmm. It's going well, things are going awesome. And then one day you're like, shit, I don't have enough clients for the month. This doesn't feel easy or wealthy. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> then that's the opportunity to use what's happening in your environment to go deeper internally. Okay. What part of me is still holding on to this old duality? What part of me is mm -hmm. not feeling worthy of receiving what part of me is right like wanting yeah. to be seen wanting yeah. to be integrated and yeah. to use it to go deeper instead of instead of to use it to make yourself frustrated feel lack feel not good enough to actually use it in service of growth to use it in service of becoming a better practitioner to use it like and all the discomfort that comes with it that's that that i think is another piece that happened with this house for me it was like this freaking sucks. I don't like this. Right. My lease ended before we found this place. So I had to live in this place. That I don't really want to live in mm -hmm. for like two and a half weeks. Uh, woe is me. Right. Like there was this, all this contrast for me. Mm -hmm. And I, one thing that I think I did pretty well throughout the process was like, all right, this is teaching me something new that I'm going to then be able to share. This is going to help me up level my whole business, my whole understanding of the universe. So I'm just, 
Yes, yes, give it to me. So that's a very different approach than most of us are used to taking because we, most of us don't want to make mistakes. Most of us want to just like, not. like, let's just get it all right the first time through and then everyone mm -hmm. will like us and we'll get good grades and everything will be fine. Perfect. Sounds ideal. <laughs> the ideal life, right? It's never boring. ideal. A little boring. No. Yeah, a little boring. Never ideal. Well, and so actually it's like, thank goodness it doesn't work, right? Because it doesn't. Mm -hmm. At least that's in my life and in what I see in other people that never, that approach doesn't actually get us the results that we want. No. So that's, that's the opportunity when we don't have the result that we want is to go deeper. It's like, oh, the result is here for me. So what is it that wants to be seen, learned, integrated, claimed so that I can have it all, all the way? And in fact, can I share one more story about this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The first time that I set a big financial goal for myself was in the like first six months of my business. And I set a goal of, I think it was $15,000 in one month. And I came up with a whole plan to make it happen. And I think I had six weeks that I set to, to do it. I, I was gonna make 15,000 in one month, but I gave myself a little running start. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do it. And I was so freaking pissed. Yeah. Like, like when I didn't. Yeah, of course. Damn it, oh, why didn't this work? And then the next month, I, I reflected on it with my coach. We went really deep understanding one of the things that I saw was how hard I was making things, like how hard I was working. And so then the next month, that was my practice. I was still reaching for the same financial goal, $15,000, but I was really diligently working to not make it hard, to let it be easy. Mm -hmm. And that was like a moment to moment practice for me because I, like a lot of people, my kind of default setting is like, I'm going to work hard. Mm -hmm. And that month I made $20,000. And when I got like, not right. I surpassed my goal. Mm -hmm. It was a month late, but when it happened, I was so grateful that I hadn't made my goal the first time, because if I had, it would have reinforced the idea that working hard was a good strategy for me. And so as uncomfortable as it was, as financially challenging as it was to not meet the goal the first time, there, it was a gift because that was the beginning of me really understanding what it meant to let, let life be easy, let the manifestation be easy. And so each time I've increased my financial goal for myself, I'm now tethering, this is the win-win, right? Mm -hmm. I want the money and I want the ease. I only have so many hours in the day. I can't work exponentially harder. No. So it's got to come from somewhere else. And I'm emphasizing this because I think that this is, this is like a particularly juicy nugget for, for your listeners to mm -hmm. really understand that it's actually working with ease, allowing ease to come in, which doesn't mean that you're lazy or like not showing up to work, but mm -hmm. that you're right. Like prioritizing, taking time off on Saturday or whatever in order to create truly the life of wealth that you want truly this this for me anyway it's this box mm -hmm. i'm not actually interested in this box yeah not interested in the sacrifice mm -mm. Mm -mm. no i want the wealth and i want the ease and i want them both together so that's what i chose that's what that's what the universe guided me toward that contrast that that not giving me what i wanted was actually giving me what i wanted Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm just as you're sitting as you're saying that I'm like, yeah, I need to do some reevaluation of what I'm what how the way that I work and the way that I look at because I think I have I'm not seeing like seven, eight patients a day. I'm not really working when in fact, of course I am. Yeah. But I have always had that mentality of work hard, work hard, work hard. And if you yeah. work hard, that's like working hard is the only way. Instead of saying, well, I could still work hard, quote unquote, but it doesn't have to feel hard. Does that make sense? Or like Absolutely. still put the work in, but it doesn't have to feel like this daily slog. 
right? Is that a word? I don't even know if that's a Absolutely. Word. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's part of the middle class mindset that mm -hmm. all of us were raised with, even folks that are not middle class, mm -hmm. that, that such a pervasive majority of, of the Western world is middle class. So even, yeah. even folks that were born either very low income or very upper class still have the middle class mindset mm -hmm. embedded, which is work hard, get paid, and then take the fucking weekend off. Yeah, right. So it's like the middle class mindset works hard in order to get the paycheck and in order to get those days off. The entrepreneurial mindset, the service-based mindset is working in service, working to live our purpose. Mm -hmm. It's not a sacrifice to do the work. So, and it, that's, there are probably days, my guess is that everyone listening to this has days where they feel really at purpose. They're really excited about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They feel really supported and they're loving the work that they're doing. And on those days, maybe they would want to see 10 patients. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at whatever point, this sort of like little tone of self-sacrifice starts to creep in, that's the moment to set the boundary. Nope, not doing that. That's not actually in service. That's an old paradigm. I'm mm -hmm. in, came into this lifetime to change that for myself and for everyone that comes after me. And that's, it's also connected to like this, this thing that we were talking about. It's in healthcare, it's in education where there's just this at the like, so much self-sacrifice, yeah. so much martyrdom. Yeah. And it's like the buck has to stop somewhere in order for anyone to experience real joy and abundance in their life. So why not be you? Absolutely. And I can't think of, I have no rebuttal to that whatsoever. <laughs> and I also think, high five, high five. I also think that it's a perfect time to wrap up the podcast because I can't think of a better way to end than that. I love it. I love it. That being said, I have one more question. And it's a oh, question yes. that I ask everyone. So given where you are now in your life and in your career, what would you tell, what advice would you give to you mm -hmm. as a new grad out of college? You know, what's funny when I knew you were going to ask me this question mm -hmm. and I had one thought, but what's coming up now is actually, it's a little different and it's, it, it might not even be the answer to your question, but I feel like I'm There's I no to wrong share it answer. anyway. I think that the message would just be, I love you. You're doing great. You can't screw this up. No matter what you do, I'm loving you. And I'm like waiting right here to welcome you. That's, that's the message that I would transmit. I think when I, you know, when I graduated from school, I was still living in the paradigm of like, I gotta do it right or else. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so much pressure. Mm -hmm. and yeah. and just not really like loving myself in pockets but not really feeling the full embrace of myself so there's other advice that I would give but I feel like it almost wouldn't even land without that first thing mm -hmm. it's like in order for all the permission and encouragement to dream and all that stuff that I would also say the the like the the energetic template that I would reprogram into my life is just like, you are loved. You are loved. That whole container that like the wellspring of love is, is unlimited and permanent. It's unconditional. And it comes from me, mm -hmm. not from the boyfriend, not from the best friend, not from the teacher, not from even God. Although I think that that's there too, but just internally that is constantly running. So thank you so much for that question. What a beautiful thing to feel for myself. Yeah, and what a beautiful answer. I have to say, it's one of the most moving answers I've ever had um, come on uh, from any guest on the podcast. So I thank mm -hmm. you for being so open and vulnerable and sharing that. So thank you so much. Yeah. And now before we sign off, where can people find you? jessiejohnsoncoaching.com. I've got a lot going on right now. I've got a live event at the end of June. Uh -huh. I don't know if the podcast will air before then, but the, that is happening and we still have a couple spots open. When, so if when you, in June, June 25th and 26th. Nice. 
in, yeah, in San Angeles. Diego. Oh, in San Diego. Great. Yeah. At Rancho Bernardo Inn, which is this beautiful luxury location. It's going to be really fun. We will be very uncomfortable internally so that mm -hmm. we can, uh, or so that we can really do this work, but the external will be incredibly luxurious so that everybody's taken like that discomfort is a little softened. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Great. And it'll be like this, but for two intense days. And the, really the purpose is to help people develop their next vision and strategy for their business, specifically in the realm of integrating money mm -hmm. in alignment with their vision and goals, values, and spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And then, and then do the mindset work. Cause that, that's the piece we, we sort of touched on, but it's like, there's more to go into around who, who is the person who has all these things? Who is the person who lives with the win-win all the time? Mm -hmm. and, and what needs to shift on, on the inside in order to step into becoming that one? So that's, that's a big part of the, of the two days. And I'm really, really excited about it. It's going to be so fun. Well, it sounds amazing. And then I'll have, I have a, another coaching group launching in mid-July. Perfect. I have a Facebook group with live Q and A's. I'm launching a YouTube channel next month. Like there's a lot, a lot of expansion. So really there's something for everybody at whatever stage of, of, you know, readiness they have. There's, there's something to meet them there. Perfect. Well, to all the listeners, I hope that you go to jessiejohnsoncoaching.com and check her out and sign up for things. Um, it, just do it. Because obviously, as you got from this talk, that she's real, she's authentic, she's been there, done that, and is, is really there to help. So thank you so much for sharing all of this. I'm going to have to go back and listen to it like 20 times. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Karen. You're amazing. I'm so honored to be here and so grateful for you and all the work that you do. There's, oh. It's such an important service. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much. And to all of you listening, again, reach out to Jesse. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Have a great couple of days and stay healthy, wealthy, and smart.